Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this Combating Terrorism Center at West Point Roundtable discussion on Islamic State leadership. We've been very excited not only for this event, but also for the release of the documents and articles that went live on our website earlier this morning. I'm hopeful that everyone has had a chance to see this material, and I'm guessing that has led to a bit of a spike in the participation numbers on this call. Although, even in the absence of a teaser about the document release, we were thrilled by the initial interest in this event. And I think that speaks to both the interest that remains in understanding the Islamic State and its leadership, as well as the fantastic panelists who are joining us today. I would also suggest that everyone go check out the excellent reporting that Jinan Musa of Al-An TV has done on these documents. She was first out the door with this material, and from the second we shared the documents with her several weeks ago, she's done truly excellent work running things down. But before we kick off, I want to say just a few short words about the Combating Terrorism Center and our involvement in the release and analysis of this kind of material. For those of you who don't know us, the CTC was founded in 2003 here at West Point with the dual mission of developing a terrorism curriculum for cadets at the academy and also to create a research center that reaches across the operational policymaking and academic communities. At the center of the CTC's research over the past 17 years has been a program to identify key documents held by the US government that can contribute to important academic research on terrorism and counterterrorism issues and get those documents declassified for release along with research products that contextualize the material and tackle critical questions. While much of this work has been focused on primary source material captured from terrorist groups during military operations, we've also examined other documents like the interrogation reports we're here to talk about today. Releasing and examining documents like these is critically important in rounding out our understanding of groups and key individuals. So we are very excited to be here today talking about this project. The moderator for this event is Dr. Daniel Milton, the CTC's Director of Research. Daniel has been with us for seven years, and in that time has produced a number of excellent reports examining the internal workings of the Islamic State. Daniel led the effort to examine these documents for us and pull together this event. I'd also like to highlight Don Rastler and Mohammed al who were both integral parts of this whole process, and Audrey Alexander, a fantastic researcher, but also apparently a remarkably quick study on how to make a Microsoft Teams live event actually function. And finally, our CDC Sentinel team of Paul Cruikshank and Chrissy Hummel, who were essential in pulling together the publication. And of course, my sincere gratitude goes to our four panelists. I'll leave it to Daniel to introduce you, but I'm very grateful that you took the time out of your busy schedules, at quite short notice, I should add, to contribute to this important effort. So with that, I'll give one final thanks to the audience for joining us and hand it over to Daniel. Thank you. Hey everybody, it's good to have you here. I appreciate Brian for giving those introductory remarks. And I think one of the things that's sometimes a little challenging in this virtual environment is it all feels uh, a little bit distant. Uh, and so we're glad to have you here as our guests. Uh, we're excited for the opportunity to talk about some of this material and looking forward to hearing from our excellent panelists who I think are gonna help us have uh, a really rich discussion about this material. So as Brian mentioned, I'm Daniel Milton. I'm the Director of Research here at the Center. Um, before I get too far into uh, what we're gonna talk about today, I just wanna go over uh, a quick administrative item. The option to submit questions is available to you. And so please feel free to submit those questions. You will not necessarily see um, what others' questions are. Uh, it's only visible to us here in the in the kind of team, but we will do our best to, to work those questions into the discussion if we can, if, if we've got the time. Uh, and we hope that we'll be able to, uh, through that mechanism, have a, a, a more uh, fulfilling discussion for everyone who's attending here today. So I first wanna thank all the individuals who have joined us to be able to participate in this panel today. Uh, these individuals are known to many of you, so I don't necessarily want to uh, give lengthy bios, but I do feel that some context is helpful in understanding uh, why they're on this panel and what we're hoping to achieve. So first, I'm just going to introduce uh, each of them. Dr. Huro Ingram is a senior research fellow at the George Washington University's Program on Extremism. He's done field work all over the world. He's published in all types of venues, and his work on strategic communications, on terrorist group ideology and history, and on the role of charismatic leadership is something that I think will bring a really unique uh, insight to this type of material focused on someone like Almala. Dr. Gina Ligon is the director of the National Counterterrorism Innovation Technology uh, an education initiative, Insight, at the University of Nebraska Omaha. She is also an associate professor there of management and collaboration science. 
among many other things, one of the things that I appreciate most about Gina is that she brings a unique perspective on how to think about organizations and leadership. Given her business uh, background, uh, and I think that that's going to be helpful as we try to uh, understand what this material tells us. Dr. Craig Whiteside is an Associate Professor of National Security Affairs at the U.S. Naval War College, and he is a Senior Associate uh, at the Naval War College's Center on Irregular Warfare and Armed Groups. Uh, he's also a fellow at many other places around the world, got a lot of great connections. He also happens to be a former U.S. Army officer, and so in addition to understanding a lot about um, the organization uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, ISI. Uh, he uh, also has a unique perspective, having also uh, been on the practitioner side uh, of the of the kind of uh, discussion. So we're excited to have him participating with us today. And then certainly last uh, but not least is Dr. Cole Bunzel. We're excited to have him here. He is a fellow uh, at the Hoover Institution. His work has obviously uh, done a lot of uh, uh, you know, been really helpful to provide a lot of insight into um, ideology of terrorist organizations, particularly Islamic State. He also is familiar um, and has written very widely on Sunni jihadism. And so between all of our panelists, I feel like what we, what we really have is people who have different perspectives, but a common desire to extract interesting insights from this type of information. And so I'm excited to have them here. I just want to give a couple of quick introductory words about the material that we'll be talking about. If you haven't already seen, there are three documents which we will be discussing today. They are known as tactical interrogation reports, often referred to with the shorthand TIRs. And so if you hear our panelists say TIRs or if you read it in any of the articles, that's what it's referring to. These three documents um, are all kind of covering a period of time in January 2008. Um, one uh, of the TIRs was uh, was uh, a summary of a session uh, that took place with Almala uh, less than 24 hours after his capture, and the other two uh, represent a time period about two and a half weeks after that. And so there's a little bit of time distinction, and that's an important part of context for understanding uh, why these documents uh, potentially can be reliable and why we can certainly try to extract some interesting insights from them. So. I know that uh, I've already given a lot of introductory remarks, but I hope that that was useful uh, in, in kind of setting the scene. And so what we're going to do now is I'm going to turn about eight to ten minutes over to each panelist to just give their uh, their overall reactions to this material and perhaps share one or two things that at least to them stuck out when they first were able to look at the material and read through. And then after we go through each of the panelists, we'll get into uh, some more of the question and answer period. And so what I'd like to do is uh, get started with Craig. And so uh, I'm going to kick it over to him here in a minute. But again, I just want to welcome everybody out to the to the panel today. And I hope that we all are able to walk away learning something. I know that I have uh, from my interactions with these panelists. So thanks for being here. Uh, Craig, I'm going to kick it over to you. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, thank you for the invite. Uh, I'd like to thank the CTC for the research and documents that have been available uh, on this particular group since the very beginning. I first encountered this group on our deployment to Iraq in 2006 and 7, as Daniel mentioned. But I didn't really start understanding this group until afterwards when I started reading early CTC products from Reed, Brian, Will, Phil, Asaf, and Clint, uh, and many others. So uh, the current team is, is also pretty incredible. And so what I'm what I'm saying is I'm probably your biggest customer and fan out there. Uh, you didn't know that, but I'm telling you now. I'm also pretty thankful to be talking about this particular period of time, 2007, uh, which was Almala's time in the in the organization that he's describing in the interrogation reports, uh, and also through 20, 2008. Uh, this is a period that I experienced personally uh, on the ground, but also it's a pivotal pivotal uh, period in the group's life cycle. My co-authors, Charlie and Herrero, who's on the panel here, uh, in a book we recently wrote, to uh, they tolerated me writing an entire chapter on this particular period with four different documents uh, that we uh, excerpted. Uh, and that's in the, the ISIS reader. Uh, and lastly, uh, I'm a West Point alum, so I'm proud to be here. Go Army, be Navy. All right, uh, some background. The killing of Abu Bakr last fall was followed by an announcement by the group with a replacement anonymous caliph. No details other than a name, his religious training, 
and his experience fighting the Americans. Uh, despite this, it netted dozens of leader-specific pledges from affiliates around the world. This is an interesting test of the new global caliphate. So the question then, who is he? What, how, do you, uh, how does appointing Abu so-and-so work for this organization? It has worked, at least in the short term, in keeping affiliates tied to Islamic State and the enterprise continuing to disperse, largely decentralized and discontiguous global insurgency. The press release announcing him as the third leader of the Islamic State since its founding, following Abu Umar al-Baghdadi and Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, told us a few things that were unverified at the time. Assuming that the U.S. government is correct that this current caliph is uh, al Mala, the documents we re-reviewed, re uh, the interrogation reports, confirm much of what the group did claim. Uh, so that's important to note. He is obviously a veteran of the group, having been captured on the battlefield in 2008. He does report to have an education in Quranic studies from Mosul University, and he does claim a tribal lineage to Muhammad's tribe, a criteria this group set in, in 2006. He fits the profile of all of his predecessors and claims that uh, claims that are out there now that he's a transitional leader are likely wrong and not for the first time. This document release is important because the group wants to keep him shrouded in mystery as long as possible. So I think releasing these details is appropriate and smart and should be replicated as often as possible. After all, they would prefer to keep him anonymous. This is a bit different than we understand leadership, let's say in America, in American politics, uh, and it's quite different than Al Qaeda does business. But this is their way of changing leaders. It's uniquely them. It's been that way since the transformation from Zarqawi to an Islamic State. Both Abu Umar and Abu Bakr had very similar anonymous introductions, were kept in the background for a long time, particularly during long periods of rebuilding. And I'll leave some of those details for my more, much more distinguished co-panelists to cover with more authority. A uh, quick note on the documents, we've only seen three out of 66, but I learned a surprising amount. I'd recommend that people take advantage of the wonderful CTC web website, much like I have over the last decade, particularly working on my dissertation um, quite a while ago to read these primary sources once they're posted. And when you're in them, you can find a lot of connections to other CTC documents that are on the website. Uh, I, know, I know I did and, and found that uh, pretty helpful. Uh, I hope we get a chance to read more because I feel our government does itself a service when it outsources a lot of this analysis to people uh, like my colleagues on this panel. And I hope they find uh, products that we produce out of these uh, documents helpful in their policy domains, debates. Uh, some observations. Uh, I'll start with his Islamic State story uh, for a little bit of context. You know, he joins the group. It's interesting to me that he joins the group in early 2007. This is a pivotal time for the group. It recently declared the Islamic State of Iraq and what uh, my friend Nibra calls the proto caliph, right? The leadership position. And this might have pushed him to finally make a choice after four years of resistance and insurgency. So it's very interesting that this is when he chooses or at least admits that he gave uh, allegiance to the group. Uh, in early 2007. This is a year the Sawa Tribal Awakening forms a coalition with fragments of several other re resistance groups. Several of them are mentioned in the interrogation reports that would rather reconcile with the government than live under an Islamic state in Sunni majority areas of Iraq. This puts severe pressure on the group as early as late 2006 and leads to large numbers of defections in their ranks by mid to late 2000, 2007. Interestingly, none of this is reflected in the al Mala interrogations. It's the year he joined, spent the year working his way up to be the Mosul Sharia advisor and the deputy wali of Mosul before his capture in early 2008. These are key positions and a very key location. He mentions helping to vet Abu Omar uh, Baghdad, al-Baghdadi's speeches, a type of task for a high-level Sharia official. So re-looking at what we got right and wrong about this organization. It's interesting to me that he joined in 2007 and stayed. It gives him some credibility. His time in prison is very common for the senior leaders of this organization and his status as a member who joined in the beginning of the Islamic State project is probably compelling to newer members. One thing he confirmed that's been misreported in the press is that he was not a Ba'ath Party member I've written about the myth of the Ba'ath influence about this group. It's a contrarian take to be sure, 
but he spent a year plus as a conscript private getting minimal military experience, but avoiding the stink of the Ba'ath Party label. Again, it's his Quraysh tribe, his tie and his Quranic degree and his time in the Sharia roles that fulfill the, the required credentials for him to be a leader in this organization, at least as they set it out. His ability to get an education in Quranic studies in this period when they are relying on outsiders. So for example, the general Sharia of the, of the Islamic State at the time is Suleiman al utaybi who's a Saudi. And his tenure is a massive failure. He ends up getting fired. And it demonstrates the need at this time in the organization to develop people like al Mala and get them to join and give the group some much needed religious guidance throughout the ranks. It's a critical shortage of, of the type of people they need. So it's possible he was groomed before he joined or that he was a covert associate of the group for some time before making it official. If you look at Abu Dua slash Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi's career, it's very similar. He was probably, uh, Abu Bakr was probably a member of multiple groups before joining the Islamic State and working for uh, Zarqawi uh, in 2005. Other de declassified documents I was reading earlier this summer indicate that Al-Qaeda in Iraq and later the Islamic State of Iraq made concerted efforts to infiltrate certain university departments to conduct dawah and influence their curriculum. So the Islamic State story that I get from these documents is also interesting. And it got my attention that the Islamic State's making a concerted effort at this point to integrate Sharia oversight into the media department specifically. When you look at the organizational charts of this period on the CTC website for 2007, you'll see there's no Sharia position in the, in the media wire diagram, but they're beginning to integrate it. They're routinizing in 2007, just a few months after creating uh, what they called the Islamic State of Iraq, and they're integrating Sharia into other departments as well, security and military. And I'm not sure who who was behind this, but it seems up to it seems up to Al Maula as the Mosul Sharia advisor to execute this policy. That's his job to vet and nominate the people that are going to work in these different areas. And again, it's hard not to emphasize that this is an organizational priority during an acute crisis in their life cycle. So why integrate Sharia personnel and other sections of the group? According to Al Maula, there's a necessity for someone to control violence in the organization, as well as the massive illegal activity that's going on. He volunteers that this is causing problems with rival insurgents and the population, something that we've read uh, in CTC reports of the past. When he's captured, he has documents on a wheat shipment, flour shipment that's stolen by the group for resale. So it shows you the level of involvement uh, of what his day-to-day -day activities are. That's his role sanctioning capital punishment on civilians, or police caught violating the, the group's red lines. There seems to be a realization that this new political entity called the Islamic State of Iraq needs to get control of their own people, who are probably not much organized, uh, more than a, a bunch of criminal gangs, and discipline them in a funneling disparate efforts and activities towards the political goals of the organization. So I've turned now to his self-reported role outside the organization Almala relates his role as a broker with other resistance groups as they try to negotiate disputes. It seems to be a pretty normal and recurring function for him. In other words, he's engaging in an ongoing effort to reduce conflict between the Islamic State and its rivals, Ansar al-Islam, the Islamic State, the Islamic Army of Iraq, and the Mujahideen Army. These are some of the major groups still in Mosul at this time. This, these relationships seem to be much more cooperative than conflictual, at least in Mosul. And Almala specifically references an arbitration between the Islamic State and two other groups over a rival group's killing of three individuals that were thought to be Iraqi police, but turn out to be Islamic State and Islamic Army members. So the cooperation among these groups, especially in Mosul in 2007, is something to think about as we try to understand how the Islamic State ends up besting all of these other groups between 2007 and 2014. There's an insight here that I jumped on based on some research I'm doing here at the Naval Post Graduate School with my colleague, Mohammed Hafez, who's familiar to the CTC. He wrote for him as early as 2007. And that's the idea of political consolidation within insurgencies. Al Mala describes an incident that happened 
while well, he's advising the, the Wali of Mosul after four senior Mujahideen army leaders defect to the, the Islamic State. That's what's happening at this particular period. Um, th this group, the Mujahideen army, like the Islamic army of Iraq, are fractured by the Sawa tribal backlash and had many members join the Islamic State. But this is a, a time when the tide is turning against the Islamic State and it appears that quite a few of them changed their minds and try to flip once more. Green Egan on, on Bea is a serious offense for this group, and the Wali of Mosul, who was Al Maula's boss at the time, has them killed. According to Al Maula, this becomes a major issue for the Islamic State leadership, and the Mosul Wali and the security emir are relieved of their duties and replaced, really, essentially for following the Islamic State's own rules and ideology. Um, it appears that the pragmatists in the group's senior leadership above them understood that killing four former leaders of another group, a rival group in Mosul, was not a good thing. They might have done the same thing if they were in that position, but to keep the peace, they transferred out the two former leaders of Mosul. And this is an anecdote, I think it's a bit revealing about the organization, how it can be pragmatic at times, and what Al Mala probably learned during this tumultuous period. It's a period, I think. Uh, would do well to continue researching. So it's great that we're doing this. My last point is that Mosul was a center of gravity for the group long before I think we understood. That is an understanding about this group, but I think it's it's something that happened earlier than we understood. In 2007, the group's national level leadership placed the media department in Mosul, according to Al Maula. This is interesting from an organizational perspective. So they've got the central media, al Furqan Media, which is still its top tier media outlet, same one, with responsibilities all over Iraq, as well as for vetting the religious content in Abu Umar and Abu Hamza's speeches at the time. And they're being supervised by al Mala, who's the general Sharia of Mosul, and not Walaya Nineveh or what they called the Northern region at the time. They just don't have this level of institution left. So they park it underneath a subordinate unit which is quite flexible. It's, it also speaks to a pretty high level of responsibility given Al Mala at a very early point in his Islamic State career. So either he's in this group longer than we understand or he's willing to admit, or he's groomed for this fast track by people, um, by, the, by the people around him. I'd add that the Islamic State leadership that he outlines and discusses in depth in his interrogations uh, at the at the Mosul level and higher, uh, many of these names are known to us for people who've tracked the, the organization for some time. They've gone on, they went on to become senior level leaders in that period between 2007 and 2012, and many of them were killed or captured, uh, quite possibly uh, based off of information that he gave uh, while he's in detention. So, um, thank you, Daniel, for that for that opportunity. I'll turn it back to you. Craig, thank you so much for uh, sharing all those insights. Uh, as I, I wish you all could see my desk right now. I've got sticky notes everywhere, just taking uh, uh, note of all the things that were raised. And I hope that that emphasizes to everybody the value that can be found in these documents, as well as some of the unanswered questions that still remain. And so I, uh, I would encourage everyone to take a look at these documents. I see that a couple people in the question and answer um, uh, uh, function have asked where they can be accessed. They're available at the CTC website, uh, which is ctc.usma.edu. You can also go to the CTC's Twitter feed at CTCWP uh, and then link to the documents from there. So those are some places to get them. But thank you so much, Craig, for setting up and, and really highlighting so many of those wonderful points. Um, I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Cole uh, and, and give him a chance to either build on or perhaps uh, you know, uh, add some different color from what uh, Craig has uh, pointed out or, or, you know, and just generally, uh, Cole, what, you know, get your reactions to all of this. So I'm going to kick it over to you. Hi, Daniel. Thanks for having me as part of this conversation. Um, the thing I'd like to concentrate on is Maula's religious background and credentials as we learn about them in these documents, which is something that Craig uh, it's already touched on. So it's been reported in both the Western and the Arabic press that Al Maula has some kind of degree 
um, from the University of Mosul in Islamic studies, and that he's been known inside of the organization as El Usted or the professor, meaning that he has some kind of religious authority. Um, and all of that is largely borne out here in these documents. One of his nicknames, according to the interrogation reports, is Ustez Ahmed. And he says he received a master's degree in Quranic sciences from the University of Mosul in January 2007. So like his predecessor, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, al-Mawla, aka Abu Ibrahim al-Hashimi al-Qurashi, as ISIS likes to call him, has a religious scholarly background. Baghdadi, of course, having received a PhD in Quranic sciences from the University of Baghdad. And also like Baghdadi, Imelda worked as a preacher, as the Imam of a mosque, which would mean that he can probably give a pretty good sermon, as Baghdadi certainly could. Now, as it happens, Imelda has not given any kind of audio address since he was announced as the new caliph in October 2019. Um, it doesn't seem, however, that that's because he's incapable of doing so. There's probably another reason why he's holding off on doing that, whether that's related to operational security or he's just waiting for the right time, it's not clear. But Baghdadi, it's probably worth noting, waited more than two years before giving his first audio address as leader of the Islamic State of Iraq. So there is a precedent uh, for this kind of a wait. Um, and there's another aspect of the Maula's religious background that stands out to me uh, in these reports, and, and that is his claim in the first of the uh, in interrogation reports that he is a Sufi and that for this reason he was never able to give bayah or the oath of allegiance to the leader of the Islamic State of Iraq. Um, now this is in my opinion a very curious and probably dubious claim. Um, it may be, I haven't read uh, Jinan Musa's report yet uh, on this. I think I've been told that she might have some insight here. But it may be that Omaula had some uh, background or experience uh, as a Sufi, Sufism, of course, being the mystical dimension of Islam, which uh, is seen as a form, is generally seen as a kind of polytheism by the Islamic State of Iraq. So to be a Sufi is something of a death sentence. Uh, so it would be odd for al Maula to have been a Sufi at this point. But there is a possibility that he's drawing on a kernel of truth. He has a Sufi past or Sufi family or something like that. Um, the idea that he's getting at, which is that he's so committed to his Sufi beliefs that he could not possibly obey the leader of the Islamic State of Iraq uh, in all things looks like a good lie to me. And indeed, it's really contradicted by what we read in the next two interrogation reports where al Maula describes his various leadership roles in the Islamic State uh, in Mosul. Um, and this goes back to something that's been touched on, which is the discrepancy between the earlier and later interrogation reports. Um, the earlier interrogation, in the earlier interrogation report, um, Al Maula, which this is the report that um, is of his interrogation uh, just after he was captured. Uh, in that report, Al Maula was being much more deceptive, in my opinion. He was trying to hide the extent of his role in the group. He says, for instance, that he's a Sufi and he's just a mere religious scholar who joined, and this is a quote, in order to stop fighters attacking innocent people. Uh, I don't believe that. Um, in the next two interrogation reports, uh, which come two weeks later, He's much more forthcoming about his role. He doesn't appear to be belittling uh, himself uh, at all. Um, he tells us, for instance, that his first appointment with the Islamic State was as a Sharia instructor, and that then he became the general Sharia Amir for the city of Mosul, and then he became the deputy Wali or deputy governor of Mosul. And that is all in the span of five months. That's a pretty meteoric rise for someone who, as he claims, had no affiliation with the organization previously. Uh, in all likelihood, and this is something Craig alluded to, um, my, my sense would be that al Maula was already a committed jihadi well before he joined the Islamic State of Iraq in March 2007. If that is in fact when he joined, he didn't have some kind of previous, if unofficial, affiliation. Um, he probably had some earlier experience with other jihadi groups, if not Al-Qaeda, uh, then something else in Iraq. Um, otherwise, the rise of from religious instructor to the deputy Wali of Mosul in five months is pretty hard to explain. Um, though perhaps his religious credentials would have propelled him up the ladder faster than most. Whatever the case, uh, there's no way he was, in my, in my view, I don't think he could have been a committed Sufi in any meaningful sense while serving in these leadership roles. That makes really no sense. Um, but this brings me to the issue of, of religious knowledge and credentials more generally. 
Um, it's remarkable to me that both Baghdadi and Al Mawla have had this religious scholarly background. Uh, now, I know someone will say um, this is not necessarily a very impressive religious scholarly background. And that's certainly not what I'm saying on an objective level. I'm sure it's not, uh, but it is something. Um, and it was clearly very important to the group. And as Craig uh, mentioned, the, the Qadi or the, the chief judge of the group uh, at the beginning of the Islamic State of Iraq um, was someone that they could not trust. So having people in the group with religious scholarly credentials was clearly uh, very important. And we see the, how, what kind of a premium on religious knowledge the Islamic State is putting both for its leaders and as a point of emphasis throughout the organization um, more generally. That's something the group I think really does take seriously. Um, a, a good illustration of this is in the reports. Uh, Mawla talks about how he was training Sharia officials, even ensuring that they were giving lessons to fighters, um, that is giving lectures and advising small groups of fighters, uh, just basically being embedded in, in small groups. Um, the Sharia officials were prominent in the organization, and so it's not a great surprise that the last two leaders uh, have been Sharia officials themselves. Um, the issue of religious knowledge is also relevant, I think, in the context of the caliphate claim. So as many of you will know, classical Islamic law sets out a number of requirements that a candidate for the caliphate has to meet in order to assume the caliphate. These requirements include things like justice, probity, soundness of body and mind, wisdom, and religious knowledge. So having that background in Quranic science certainly would help in bolstering the claim to religious knowledge and thus to the caliphate. Another prerequisite for the caliphate, of course, is descent from Quraysh or the Prophet Muhammad's tribe. Um, and interestingly, here we learn or we are told in the interrogation reports that Amaullah's ethnicity is Arab and not Turkmen, as some outlets have reported it is. Uh, and so if he is Arab, it's much more likely or it's much more plausible um, to make a, a claim to the Qurayshi heritage. Um, so there is another um, possible requirement that he has met. So in short, there really is nothing in these reports that would undermine al Mawla's caliphate claim, uh, except for perhaps the issue of probity, uh, because he doesn't seem to have been very principled in the way that he was ratting out so many of his colleagues. Uh, but I'll let others uh, talk about that aspect of, of these reports. And with that, I'll give it back to Daniel. Thank you so much, Cole. Um, I feel like as we begin to peel back some of these documents, in some senses we get we get answers, but we also find more questions. And uh, I think that goes a little bit to Craig's point earlier, which is it would be really uh, helpful. And, and certainly we hope that there will be more information forthcoming because I think that there's a lot more that we can learn uh, from from this type of material as well as other type of work uh, that is going on. And so I appreciate those thoughts and, and I've got some notes that we can uh, come back to later uh, for sure. So uh, what I'd like to do now is uh, is invite Gina um, to to share uh, to share some of her initial thoughts and reactions uh, again, thinking about, um, you know, what you think are some of the top takeaways from these documents from your perspective. Uh, which may again align with what's already been said or may be different or may be contradictory. I think that there's certainly some uh, some some of that in, in in these documents. So Gina, if I could, I'm going to go ahead and and kick it over to you. Thanks so much, Daniel. Um, I'd like to begin my remarks by actually reading a section from Report C, page four. Uh, he says, I followed up on media flyers. Before releasing any propaganda flyer for ISI by the media, I had to read the flyer and I make sure there were no Sharia errors. We also selected a special Sharia for media. His name is Salam. In a later section of that same report, he says, during my time as a Sharia leader for the city of Mosul, I nominated six judges. So I highlighted these excerpts because they're emblematic of what we learned from a figure who, while still in the shadows somewhat, um, I think are coming in, is coming into sharper focus for those of us who study leaders of terrorist groups. So as Daniel mentioned, I'm an organizational psychologist and 
For the past 12 years, I built a data set doing just that, looking at leadership style of terrorist leaders, ter leaders of ext violent extremist groups, and what that means for their organizations. So for the next few moments, what I'd like to do is describe how these documents inform us about Almala as a leader and the organization he's likely building. I'll wrap up with an assessment of what that means for his strengths, but I think most importantly from the US military standpoint, what it means for his weaknesses. So to provide some context, I should probably tell you a little bit about how an organizational psychologist views these documents. Uh, you see, the most significant research effort that I've done today is, is to draw from primary source documents to be able to assess someone's leadership style. And you have to be able to be put into our data set as a, a leader who we can comfortably and reliably say we know some about um, their leadership, you have to meet three criteria. One is there needs to be interview responses um, that are unscripted. Uh, two, you need to have some historically verified events that shape that leader early on in his education and career. And then three, um, you really need to have multiple sources uh, to be able to reliably say that it wasn't biased or used from one independent source. And so these documents to me um, really helped uh, make sure that he's an individual that I could put into my leader data set. So before uh, Daniel Milton and West Point gave me uh, these reports, we had 289 leaders that we'd assess their leadership style. Um, of terrorist groups. Uh, I can comfortably say that as of today, we now have 290. To me, as an org psychologist, these documents are incredibly helpful. Uh, the interview responses allow us to see what constructs he chooses to describe his relationship to others, um, his relationship to people who he views as different than him. Uh, the historically verified events are important because what they do is they show us the mental model um, of how he's going to solve problems going forward. So we know um, from a psychology standpoint that our experiences and our connections with others at formative times in our life form how we're going to view new events that come in. And so to be able to have those historically verified events, and there's another article in the Sentinel um, that was released this morning that really does a fine job of uh, verifying the factual accuracy of a lot of what he um, stated from these TIRs that we just didn't know before. That's an incredibly important thing to be able to understand how this person thinks and how he's going to make decisions. Um, and then the last piece about reliable information, you know, I, I look to see it, it would of course been better to have in his native tongue um, a verbatim transcript of what he said. But what was interesting to me was the remarkable consistency across time periods of how he described people and the constructs that he chose to be able to um, uh, relate himself to them. And so for me as a psychologist, uh, looking to see that there were two different interpreters, there are two different uh, types of uh, interviews that were happening at different time periods, that gives me a great deal of assurance that this is indeed reliable information about his leadership style. So if I can comfortably say that and say that I know something about his leadership, what does that mean for him as a person? Well, uh, hopefully we'll get into this a little bit more through some of the Q&A, but I think the main takeaway for me is that this is a um, detached individual from his inner circle. Um, he likely sees those even closest to him as expendable resources that he can discard um, whenever they no longer serve his purpose. So if you look at statements of how he describes others, he uses a lot of um, what we would call othering language where he describes characteristics about them that are different from him. Um, that's uh, very important because other leaders who've done that, um, particularly uh, violent leaders, um, tend to relate to others that are more similar to them or comport to, to their own background. Um, and so what this means is that they oftentimes will build inner circles um, that are uh, com comprised of people who are like them and similar to them. Um, homogenous, mirrors that sort of reflect back what he thinks is important to be a person. 
So you see, you also see a lot of punitive language in how he describes um, other people in their role and responsibility. So this is someone who um, will likely hold grudges and uh, be very um, punitive with people who he perceives has wronged him. So some implications of that. Um, number one, uh, you know, it's been 12 years since this report was taken. So unless something significant has happened to shape his worldview about um, diversity and inclusion of people who are different than him, this may be someone who doesn't see loyalty to the cause or to the overarching belief system as enough. Um, this is someone who might build a, a very homogenous inner circle. Um, people who um, are perceived as outsiders may be seen as untrustworthy. Um, and if there are members right now who are in his inner circle, they may have already picked up on this, that they don't quite feel like they're um, enough or that they are, um, you know, comporting to what he views as important for an inner circle. So these constructs that he used across the three reports helped me understand how he perceives other people. And the, the overarching takeaway that I would have is that he sees them as cogs in his greater machine, but specifically cogs that are dispensable uh, when they no longer prove valuable for his personal uses. Um, and you see that with his willingness to be able to give very specific and indicting details uh, about these individuals. But his experiences, his experiences early on in the organization and academically shape um, and gave, gave me the most information about the kind of organization he's likely building. So I've voraciously read um, analysts who have talked about the ISIS 2.0 and what the future of ISIS is going to be. And, but what's interesting from these reports is that none of those analysts so far have really articulated what I see about the strategy that could unfold uh, with him at the helm. So my bias as an org psychologist is the most important role of a leader is to define the strategy of the organization. And regardless of the style of the leaders that I've studied, um, they all do this with varying levels of success. So how do they do it? Well, org psychologists would say that they, they build their understanding of their current situation based on life experiences or what we call bio data, life history events that were formative and sort of inform them of how the world works. So if you listen to what Cole and Craig said earlier and you look back at and you triangulate that with um, his statements about hierarchy and the importance of duty and roles and responsibility and lines of authority, um, what this tells me is that this person really values um, order and structure and clear guidance on who reports to whom, why, um, and even down to the region and the function of, of what they're doing. So the other piece that I saw was his selection of judges and um, people who would be authorities on Sharia. And he really was reinforced for that in his role in mentoring those judges and what that meant for control of society. So we saw very early on that one of ISIS's strategies was to um, conscript uh, local elites and people who were already in the power structure. Um, and specifically, I think this individual is going to go after um, individuals who could be in judge roles. And so I think that's an early warning indicator of the type of organization and where he's going to um, invest resources next, is he's going to try to understand what are the weaknesses of the existing judicial branch in, in areas, and then be able to conscript um, future judges to uh, do things in his favor and create some order. So to end my time this morning, I'll wrap up with two main takeaways. So we know a little bit about his leadership structure or his leadership style and some hypotheses that weren't presently available about the type of organization he's going to build. Declassifying documents such as these three TIRs is incredibly important for our body of knowledge about these types of leaders. If you think about the work that CTC has done and George Washington's program on extremism where they release um, primary source documents about such groups, this is incredibly important for the field of terrorism scholars to be able to make sense of who these individuals are. So I, I would call to action to be able to request more of these documents be declassified and specifically about the individuals who were in 
um, detainment with him, and particularly ones who might have also been playing a role in the formative events of ISIS during that time. So at a time when our country is in so much unrest, we are incredibly vulnerable to an attack from ISIS right now. Um, it's important for us to be able to look at these documents and to make sense of our adversary. The other thing that's happening is we're drawing down our troops in Iraq at presently um, over the next few months. And so the ones that are left behind have to know who their adversary is and the shape of the early warning indicators that might um, portend to him taking over a specific region or area. So to close, I'll end how I started, um, which is a passage that struck me when I read Report B. I'll summarize it. He says, photo 14, he is a member of ISI. Photo 15, he's a member of ISI. Photo 16, he is a member of ISI. It goes on and on. In this interview alone, Almala goes on to name 20 individuals within ISI. And over the course of the three sections or three sessions, he named 68 more individuals, what they did, who they were, what their background was, most importantly, how they differed from him. His descriptions of their roles had significant consequences for these men. At least some of the individuals using other primary sources such as detainee records and prison records that have been gathered since we found out about them um, showed that they were six of them at least were later confirmed as detainees and prisoners and may still be in U.S. custody. You see, uh, these individuals were expendable to them. Um, they were key to his release, so he gave them up. Uh, he's walking free right now, whereas they are still being held. So this is a distant leader. This is a leader who will callously use people when he no longer sees them as important to him. It's a dangerous leader. He's building up a strong and resilient organization and he will use elites in the current um, societies where he commandeers to be able to help him with that mission. Thank you so much for inviting me to this panel today. Um, I've learned such a, a great deal from my colleagues um, who have very different perspectives and training than I do and uh, excited to, to see where this takes us. Thank you. Gina, thank you so much for those comments. I, uh, I couldn't agree more. This has been such a learning experience for me and I appreciate how uh, in the midst of providing such great perspective on his leadership capabilities, you also really helped us to, to think about um, how uh, these documents, which as you noted are, are, are now 12 years old, might inform our understanding of him today, but also might open, uh, you know, future research avenues. Uh, and so I think that's a critical piece of 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 what this uh, what this material allows us to do, and also hopefully where it uh, where it steers us in the future. So thank you for making that uh, so clear. Um, for uh, the anchor leg, uh, at least in these opening comments, I'm going to go over to Hororo Ingram to to offer his. Uh, thoughts and kind of reactions to both what other presenters have said as well as kind of his take on uh, these documents or, or on this uh, project overall. So Hororo, I'd like to uh, yield the floor to you, uh, sir, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go to that point. Right, well, um, thank you, uh, Daniel, for the opportunity to participate in today's panel and uh, the early in-house discussions. And um, of course, to the um, West Point team, uh, Christina, and of course, um, Audrey and others for um, putting this all together. You know, um, we really appreciate it. Obviously, the previous speakers are brilliant, and I'll just do my best to, I guess, build upon what they've said, um, kind of wrap up um, so we can get into discussion and into the Q&A. Now, I'm sure that everyone listening in today is keen to work through the interrogation summaries, and I'm sure there's going to be a tsunami of tweets and posts that may have already started. And while I have three key observations that I want to share with you today, I think it's important to begin by reiterating to everyone, journalists, researchers, students, analysts, and practitioners, um, to keep the collection's limitations, as well as their broader contextual factors, in your mind as you're working through these documents. These are three of 66 such documents. So there is context and consequences that are naturally missing. This is an interrogation, so the nature of the discussion is different to other types of interviews. It's also difficult to gauge from the summaries the relationship between interrogator and detainee and how that evolved over time through the interrogations. And of course, these are summaries. 
uh, not transcripts. And so that's going to be important for how their contents are analyzed and evaluated. And as you've heard, the revelations contained in these three documents are fascinating. But I think it's the questions that they raise, the contradictions that can be found in the nuances, the details, which are perhaps um, even more important for painting a picture of this man, Al Mullah, and the Islamic State group during this really critical time in its evolution. And I have no doubt that it will inspire and drive a lot more contextual and investigative work. There is much that can be debated about the contents of the TIRs, but what is absolutely clear, what will strike anybody who reads these documents is that Al Mullah is a rat, he is a snitch. And if he is the caliph, then sitting at the top of this organization is a man who gave his interrogators dozens of names of ISI and AQ leaders in Mosul from the Sharia administration and military sections of the organization. And not just names, he often included physical descriptions, phone numbers, descriptions of their roles and decisions in those roles. He then places those names into organizational charts. And if that wasn't enough, he names their predecessors. His uh, description of the organization, uh, his explanations for his pocket litter, they all offer important insights, perhaps best appreciated uh, with hindsight, into how ISI intended to survive and rebuild. Um, in a previous career, I'd worked to, I guess, encourage informants. And reading through these TIRs, it reminded me in different ways of pretty typical snitching. The contradictions and tensions that emerge in his testimonies are fascinating, and I suspect hold the key to unraveling um, this story. So as Cole spoke about earlier, while the while the, the first TIR, he essentially, Mawla essentially denies his involvement in ISI and plays down his motivations. In the latter TIRs, he presents a story of his ascent through the organization that on the surface seems at best unlikely um, in its speed. The way that Al Mawla tells it, and I know that um, the others have referred to this story um, before, but he, he basically gets picked up as a graduate in early 2007. By March, he's a Sharia trainer. By July, he's helping to mediate an internal conflict. Later that month, he becomes General Shari, um, Amir of Mosul. Um, by mid-October, he's temporarily the Deputy Wali of Mosul um, before going back to General, um, um, for the General Shari Amir. And he remains in that position until his, his capture um, um, several weeks later. And yet, Al Nula, despite holding these positions, only knew about Sharia and administrative matters, but was relatively ignorant of military issues. He's more than happy to give all the information he can on leaders, but his brother-in-law was nothing but a simple driver for Al Mawla, totally ignorant to what he was doing. These contradictions and tensions are important for building a picture of Al Mawla, because while the speed of his rise seems unlikely, the details that he provides about individuals, the organization, its processes, its history, would suggest that he was a connected and relatively senior figure. So we come to another really important finding. There is something about Moore, it seems, that people in the Islamic State have noticed, and all the way back to 2007, but very likely prior to that, I agree with all the other panelists on this point, um, he has been identified as uh, someone um, of promise. And so his possible use of deception, um, for example, the timeline he provides for his rise, um, his use of diversion, for example, he provides the correct name for some individuals and not for others, um, hints that not only is the picture provided in these documents, no, su no surprise, of course, um, very far from complete, but I would argue, as Craig and Gina have, that there is a good chance that senior Islamic State leaders were probably given a plan, given a strategy to deal with interrogations. Burn up the lower ranks, do what you have to do to get out. Um, you know, it's well known that other senior leaders um, who'd gone through Bukha had um, snitched also. But even if that is the case, um, I would argue that it's even more damning for the elitist culture and the snitching in the leadership ranks. Look, time in prison is a powerful feature of the mythology that surrounds um, so many of the most prominent jihadi leaders of the 20th and 21st centuries, even further back than that. 
serve your time in the, inf in the infidels jails and it's a big boost to your reputation. Think about, say, good of sitting in an Egyptian prison and writing milestones to Olaki decades later, stating that he drew inspiration from Qutb's example during his own stint in prison to that procession of Islamic state leaders that served their time in Bukha. But if you're a snitch, that's a stain that's really hard to remove. Uh, look at Zawahiri. He's never been able to kind of lose that reputation. It's a recurring footnote against his name. Uh, that can be Moore's reputation now. Now, this collection presents vital questions, not just for researchers, um, but as I've kind of hinted to, those charged with degrading the influence of the Islamic State and the morale um, in its ranks. Answering some really critical questions are going to be uh, really important to that counter Daesh effort and, and not just to the research field. Um, these questions about Mawla's uh, Qureshi uh, lineage, um, questions that remain about um, Mawla's actual revealed role in the organization and also what all of this ultimately kind of says about the organization at this moment in time uh, as Craig spoke about this crucial moment in its evolution because if the first generation of the Islamic State movement those around Zakawi are kind of revered as the founders it's arguably this generation um, those who joined and stayed through 06, 07 and 08 uh, those that kind of drag the movement from its depths um, that are crucial for understanding its revival and its successes from 2014 um, onwards. So I just want to um, conclude with a few remarks, I guess, on how I think that this can be a real boon for anti daesh efforts. The nature of the Islamic State's leadership uh, succession practices, as Colin Craig have spoken about, is to keep the identity of its top leader secret. Give them a kunya, and that secrecy provides a degree of security, but also time to develop how they will project themselves to the world. Uh, for Abu Bakr Abla Dadi, it was years before he spoke in public and then appeared um, on video. Now, if Mullah is the caliph, this is a chance to get ahead of that process and proactively shape the narrative around the leader and with it contribute to undermining the Islamic State's brand and credibility too. Um, this needs to be a full spectrum effort. And by that, I mean um, identifying vulnerabilities and exploiting them via a range of different messengers using a variety of different mediums and forums. There's been a lot of talk about the ambiguity around Amullah's lineage, and that could be a vulnerability worth exploiting through the right messengers. But what these documents reveal is that there are other very clear vulnerabilities to exploit. As we've all said, Moore is a rat. He now apparently sits at the top. What does this say about Mawla as a man, a leader, and about those who supported his rise? There is also the disposability of members for the sake of leaders. This is a recurring problem um, um, that has been um, uh, highlighted about the group, the elitism. The elitism that was so evident in how some units were left to burn in last stands while um, others escaped through 2017-18. It's reflected in the willingness of its leaders to snitch on lower ranks. Um, and I think that these can all tie in with what should be broader anti daesh influence efforts to erode the credibility gaps between the Islamic State's words and its actions. Highlighting these Seydou gaps are crucial for attacking the Islamic State's credibility, its brand and its manhaj. Now, right now, the Islamic State movement is particularly vulnerable. It's operating as an insurgency across Syria and Iraq while trying to manage a transnational enterprise. And so trust is vital for surviving and rebuilding. Putting all the focus into one vulnerability is not maximizing the efficiency and effectiveness of an influence campaign. Um, it is far more likely to hamstring it. The potential is there for these documents, and I would assume that there are many others, to really shake trust in the leadership group, undermine morale between the leadership group and its middle managers and bring into question the judgment of those who have supported Amola's rise um, through the organization. This is the potential, but it has to be realized in a um, careful, strategic and methodical way. And um, with that, um, I'll hand it back to uh, Daniel.
Aurora, thank you so much for uh, those wonderful points. I think, um, and we'll touch on a couple of them that you that you made. But I think your illustration at the very beginning of your comments about the limitations of this type of material is a critical one for researchers to understand. I know that it's not uncommon for people to say, "Well, what can you really make of this material? Can you trust it?" Uh, I think any researcher would be. Uh, would, would would be well advised to not take it at face value. And that's part of the reason why we want to make these documents public, but also part of the reason why we want to pursue more information in this realm so that we can hopefully shed more light on these difficult uh, questions that you've raised. But I appreciate that so much. One of the other things you talked about, which I think is interesting, is uh, Almala as a, as a rat or as an individual who gave up a lot of information about others. And, and that certainly stands out as Gina uh, illustrated in her comments. There are a lot of names here. And so I just want to kind of pull on that thread a little bit um, and I'll, I'll kind of give this question to, to Cole first. Um, you know, did you recognize any of the names he mentioned? Uh, you know, if you did, great. If not, what is the fact that he named uh, some of these individuals and that we see that their names are authentic um, or at least some of them are authentic? What does that tell us about him, you think, or about his role in the organization? So if I if I could, Cole, get your thoughts on that, that'd, that'd be great. Uh, yeah, so you know, in all honesty, I, I didn't really recognize the, any of the names except for, of course, of course, Omar al Baghdadi, who was the first leader of the Islamic State of Iraq. Uh, um, but he's not giving up him. Um, that's just the name that he, he mentions. Um, among the people that he, he mentions are probably a lot of uh, lower level administrative types, um, but not necessarily all lower level. Um, as Daniel, you, you show in that you wrote for uh, the latest uh, CTC Sentinel. Uh, people, are, it's very clear, are real people, um, including some that uh, um, to eliminate um, by mention uh, about them to, to the United States. But uh, the thing that stood out to me is, um, and I, sh I should add actually that. Um, Initially, I was quite skeptical that a lot of that giving up this information to to the authorities. And I thought that maybe he was um, just following some protocol. Um, these pseudonyms that we're talking about, Edward so and so, so it's really not a big deal. But if you look more carefully, it really does seem that he is giving very specific information. He's um, you know, height. Uh, features, things like this. At the end of one of the reports, you can see a lot of real names that the interrogators are working with. He's talking to these, about these people as, as real individuals, um, and he knows that giving this information uh, could could lead to, to their arrest. And he talks about other people who have been arrested right around the time, uh, right before he was arrested. And so it, it makes me wonder whether he had given up on the organization. This was a time when there was a lot of counterterrorism pressure from the United States. Uh, at the height of the surge, and a lot of people are being uh, arrested and detained at this time, uh, and it may be that he, he thinks that somebody else read it on him, and who cares at this point, I'm going to rat on them. Uh, one thing that we know for sure is that you know, he, he doesn't um, have the, he doesn't uh, evoke the image of someone like Zarqawi, who we just can't really imagine would uh, give this kind of information and talk to U.S. interrogators in this kind of a way. Um, the, the one thing I, I uh, one name that stood out to me, um, though it's not a name I recognized, was that of his brother-in-law. I think it was Bashar. Um, and that stood out to me because while he seems to be giving up and identifying a lot of people, it says this person is ISI, this person is ISI. When it comes to his brother-in-law, he goes, oh no, that person is not as ISI. Um, yeah, he drove for me. I slept at his house. He, he took me everywhere I needed to go. Um, Mama says he can drive, which is a little fishy. Um, but back, uh, he wasn't actually in the organization. Um, it seems like he's trying to protect uh, his family, and I've also seen evidence that he's tried to protect uh, other members of, of his family um, more recently, so that could be an interesting tidbit. Thanks, Cole. Um, I think that, uh, as, as you point out, there's some interesting nuances in who he speaks about in detail, and then to your point about uh, the brother-in-law, right, who he doesn't speak about in detail, and, and Perhaps that's another thing that someone like Gina um, 
would be able to uh, interpret it through the uh, through the lens of her kind of leadership focus. But I actually want to kick it over to um, to Craig for a minute because I know that as he was looking through this and given his deep history and understanding the players and and who's who in this era, um, be curious to know if any of these stood out to you, Craig. Any of these names, or if uh, if if you have any other thoughts on on this kind of ratting dynamic that that Herrero brought up. Thank you, Daniel. It's it's sometimes hard with the, the use of uh, pseudonyms, cunhas, but uh, th there are a lot of familiar names and quite a few of them are higher level leaders. I'll just, uh, um, you know, of interest, uh, as Cole said, he talks about Abu Omar al-Baghdadi and this is early 2008. And yet, you know, there's a lingering that there's a lingering perception that there's no Abu Omar al-Baghdadi for a pretty long time. Uh, you know, 2014 people are still questioning it. So that, there's this weird disconnect that he just kind of casually mentions it, which which probably, you know, he's not in on the conspiracy to cover this up. Um, but more more pertinent, uh, he gives up clearly the name of a foreigner, Moroccan Abu Sara, who's Abu Kaswara, who's the northern emir, who's killed in I think October of 2008. So real person hire his boss's boss basically and quite a quite a um, familiar figure for for those who study the the islamic state a uh, long time jihadist in, uh, in iraq uh, there's possibly he's he names haji hamid who's who's quite possibly in the organization at the highest level today if it's the same person so that is is one uh abu Sohaib who is becomes the Islamic State's northern commander and is killed. He's the successor to Abu Kaswara. And that's uh, is quite possibly the same person based off of where he at where he is in 2008 and who he becomes in 2010, if it's the same name. I'd also mention that even in the his description of ancillary or parallel organizations like the media, he names um, a figure a uh, high-ranking media figure in Mosul and the media mayor in Mosul in 2008 is captured and killed and has the same exact name uh, that he gives up. Uh, could be someone different, but there, that's a, probably a low probability in that case. So um, I don't know why he would do any of these things. It's quite possible that when you're laid out this information with the pictures and the names already and they ask you to confirm this stuff, you know, maybe he already understands that people know, but confirmation is is important as Cole's kind of alluding to who he lies about and who he actually, you know, targets. Uh, and also, as Gina talked about, you know, tells you a little bit about him. But, um, but I, I think there are quite a few threads that people could pull and easily find connections to senior leaders in the Islamic State who are killed or captured in 2008 to 10 and even are still in this organization today. Back to you, Daniel. Craig, I think that's such an interesting point because uh, when we think about these as being documents that are 12 years old now, I think there's a tendency to say, all right, they're in that that kind of that old box, right? And, and we can analyze them from that perspective. But one of the things that you're suggesting, particularly if we are able to get more information or as we pull on some of these names a little bit more or some of the threads that are in these documents, we may actually be able to make some of those connections to today. And I think that that's an interesting, uh, an interesting possibility for the future. Um, Gina, uh, I wanted to just give you a chance uh, on this kind of question of ratting and leadership, um, whether you know one recognized any names or whether you just have thoughts from kind of an organizational psychology perspective about what what that dynamic would kind of say about him as a leader or uh, or something along uh, those lines. Uh, so, Gina, any thoughts on that? Yeah, thanks, Daniel. I'll just briefly say, you know, when I first saw that he was giving up people, I thought in the, the time period between report one and or report A and report B, I thought maybe he's been coached up in that time frame of like this is safe information to give, and and this was part of, um, you know, their their method to you know do whatever it takes to get out. But when you look at the some of the individuals' photos that he confirmed, those people were not, those weren't detention photos. Those were those were photos that were from personal identifi identification cards or even some surveillance type photos. So he was 
giving up people who he didn't know that the U.S. actually knew where they were or or who they were um, specifically. So he might have been confirming, but it wasn't necessarily on people who were already detained. They, they weren't they weren't people that his his recollection and his identification and confirmation had real consequences uh, for people who um, trusted him. And so I think if anyone, um, I think the fact that you published these is so important because to me, there are people in the organization who could now go back and look at these these pictures and say, gosh, you know, three years after this, that person died in a drone strike or that person was detained. And, and this information that our leader gave about him contributed to that that consequence. So I think that's a, a really important point that he did give up people who he didn't know um, the, the coalition had in their custody at the time. So to me, from a, a leadership standpoint, it's even a, a more egregious violation of trust um, to be able to um, freely give those kind of individuals up. Thanks. Well, that's really that's really interesting because I think uh, obviously trust is important in all organizations, but in, you know, as you're kind of alluding to in a, in a clandestine organization, uh, it's really the foundation for uh, making sure that uh, the, the people are able to kind of effectively operate and do so with confidence that they're uh, that they're not going to be rolled up with the next raid or whatever the case might be. Um, a lot of the questions uh, from uh, the audience are alluding to um, kind of you know, we're talking about some of the things that these documents tell us, but uh, there's also things that perhaps they they don't tell us or key questions that remain unanswered uh, based on uh, what is uh, in the TIRs. And so I think there's kind of a where do we go from here type question. So we have this type of material uh, and certainly this is a good, I think, initial uh, set of documents, but, but as everyone has acknowledged, it's incomplete. What do we think about in terms of uh, of future avenues of research as we try to identify some of these gaps or as we try to think about um, how perhaps uh, other types of work could help fill in some of the blanks? Uh, I know that's kind of a broad macro question, but uh, but nobody better than Hororo, I think, to tackle uh, those those types of things. And so if I could kick it over to you, Hororo, for just some some thoughts about where kind of where we go from here and, and, and perhaps what these documents suggest as potential avenues. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. Um, there are obviously a lot of kind of loose threads uh, throughout these documents, and given that there isn't um, a lot of um, information out there already about um, El Mola, uh, there's a real opportunity here, I think, for researchers and investigative journalists to really um, get stuck into these details and kind of um, 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 explore these explore these different um, threads that emerge in here. Um, you know. The, the 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 perhaps the most critical question at this point in time is what were what were the consequences of um, of Almola giving all of those names and I think that that follow up work I I know that that is being um, done there are a lot of people looking into this kind of background to identify what those consequences were that's going to be important it's going to be important um, I think what you'll probably see over the coming weeks is more information emerging about uh, Almola. When you, um, uh, the type of individual as Gina has um, spoken about, that 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 kind of demonstrates that they can't be trusted, uh, reciprocity tends to kick in, and so I think that you're going to get a lot of information that will start to flow about the individual, about um, and about um, his his kind of peers, and so um, this could really, this could really be an opportunity, I think, for a a, a big kick a big focus of interest on what I think what what um, you know Craig has written about uh, this in, in in the ISIS reader just how important this period of time is in the history of the Islamic State movement yes the founders are important yes the that the, the, the those around Zakawi that first generation are important but it's this generation, it's the generation around Abu Umar, it's those who are joining around this time that I think had a really important role to play. And so there are these little threads that are attached to this collection of documents, but they all lead to much bigger questions 
um, that that really are very, very significant gaps, not only from a research perspective, but also have significant strategic policy um, implications as well. So I'll leave it there. I think that's a great point. Uh, certainly in, in the course of our conversation, we focused a lot on Al Mola uh, and kind of the the implications uh, for him as a leader. But to your point, I think there's some broader strategic questions that are both raised and, and maybe some partial answers given here, but, but certainly a lot of those questions remain open for future analysis based on some of this information. And so I think that uh, hopefully that's, uh, that's another opportunity for us to do some more work moving forward. Um, Cole, what are your thoughts on this, uh, on this question of where do we go from here? Or what are some of the opportunities to, to kind of move forward from here? Well, as Hararo mentioned, there are definitely a lot of holes. Uh, what I would really like to know more about is his, his prehistory before he, he joined the Islamic State of Iraq in, in 2007, if that is really when he joined, if he didn't join earlier than that, and uh, what kind of role he's played in the organization uh, after his, his release in, I believe it was 2008, um, from the from, did, did he go to the organization? Were there any repercussions for, for having uh, ratted out some of his colleagues. Did they even know about that? Is this the first time that they might be hearing that? I don't think it, it is. My guess is that he, you know, he probably um, fessed up to that quickly. Um, a lot of people were probably ratting on each other and maybe it just wasn't that big of a deal. But maybe we'll, we'll find that the impact uh, is greater than that and that there will be some kind of an effort uh, from the leadership of ISIS to try to uh, bolster his legitimacy. It's interesting so far we haven't seen really ISIS say much, if anything, at all about who uh, Abu Ibrahim al-Hashmi al-Qurashi, i.e. al mawla is. Um, when Baghdadi was um, basically uh, leading the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, and then the Islamic State, full stop, as the caliphate in 2013-2014, we learned a lot about him. The organization published a lot of uh, personal biographical information about who he was. But the Islamic State so far doesn't seem to have uh, felt that necessary in the case of Omela, but uh, perhaps uh, that will that will change. It would be interesting to see. Absolutely, um, and I think uh, again the the opportunities here for. Uh, for some future research are, are, are ripe and I would encourage everybody to, uh, to certainly take a look at these documents as a starting point for that. Um, Craig, what are your thoughts on, uh, on this question? The, the uh, you know, I think this, I think a release like this really, you know, I don't know what people are going to get out of this that's different than, than uh, what I'm looking at, but I'm sure it's going to be quite diverse and quite um, you know, the, the, the benefit of releasing documents like this is people are going to look at this from a lot of different ways and in ways I have never thought of listening to Gina, listening to Cole, uh, listening to Hororo. I mean, and that, you know, multiply that by another hundred and that's the value of, of this exercise in general. You know, for me, it's, you know, if you want to understand how the Islamic State transitioned from a caliphate back to a, a low level build, rebuilding insurgency, which they've done before in this period that Al Maula is talking about, then these are the type of documents we have. We do have to go back and look at the past. I mean, my critique of the of the research in the Islamic State to date is it fast forwards from the surge, Salwa, Islamic State collapse to the caliphate pops out of nowhere. And, you know, there's there has been a lack of introspection into into this period, and it's there's just so much more to do, as Herrero just said. So uh, I'm I'm excited to to read and think about what other people are going to get out of this, and they're already getting it out of it, and you can see it on Twitter right now. People are like, "Hey, I just picked this up. I just read this thing ten times, and I missed that." So back back to you, Daniel. Oh, that's a great point, Craig. When when I first uh, laid eyes on these documents and started reading through them a couple of times, I thought, OK, there's a finite set of information here, so I'm going to I'm going to understand all that's in there. Uh, and then having conversations with you guys, it was a, it was apparent that there were things that I didn't fully understand or that I had simply missed. Um, and I think that that's part of the benefit of making this information public is giving a lot of people a chance to to hack off on it. Um, because I think there will be different perspectives that emerge out of all of this. Uh, Gina, do you have any uh, anything to add on this uh, this particular point about uh, future 
opportunities or, or things from perhaps a leadership perspective that you think are unanswered? Yeah, I, um, yeah, so thank you. Uh, you know, one individual does not an organization make, right? And so um, I'm really interested to get TIR's release of other individuals who are in senior leadership positions right now, um, what we would call from the, the business side, the top management team. Right, and so one of the things I saw um, that was interesting, if, if these facts are accurate, that he actually started his graduate program when Baghdadi would have been finishing his dissertation in the same program. And so are there other individuals who have risen to senior positions in um, the Islamic State who were also um, in that program? And, and in addition, uh, do we have TIRs from them? Because it would be important for us to be able to understand the dynamics uh, that both shaped who they were. If you think about your own graduate or college cohort, um, you learn just as much from other people as you did um, from the content of the courses. And uh, it would be important for us to understand their relationships and their dynamics um, and, and any TIRs from individuals who we can triangulate have been in leadership or strategic decision making decisions from the Islamic State. I think, I hope that this uh, panel discussion and the reports and papers that have come out of it have uh, demonstrated that there's a lot we can learn uh, from primary source documents with responses to interviews that you know that weren't scripted or written in advance. Um, and then there's a lot that can be learned from verifying the facts that were presented in that information. And so my hope is, is that this is sort of a pilot that would allow uh, the U.S. military to release um, more of these documents for people like myself, Hororo, Craig, and Cole to be able to look at these. Um, so I, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can look at the dynamics of the top management team um, through the lens of their TIRs uh, and their interview responses when they were um, giving them. Thank you. Thanks, Gina. And um, <laughs> just want to share a quick anecdote related to this project. So in order to um, put together the, uh, the panel article uh, in which each of these experts offers some of their thoughts on these documents, um, that appeared in the CTC Sentinel this morning, uh, we scheduled a, a call to sit down and I thought, you know, I mean, maybe we'll, we'll do an hour and 15 minutes, maybe an hour and 30, no no problem. Uh, we talked for a long time and honestly, we had to cut it off at some point simply because uh, we, we couldn't keep going. And so we've tried to cover some of the questions that people have raised. Uh, there's a lot more interesting questions that are coming out and, and I hope will we'll be the seed of future research because at the end of the day, uh, what we can cover here in, in 90 minutes is is really uh, only a limited part of it. But I hope that these discussions will continue. Um, one question that was raised that, that I won't throw to the panelists for a response now, but just something to ponder is, you know, what's the response of a group like Al Qaeda to this type of information? How do they think about this from a messaging perspective? Does it inform what they do? And I think that those are, again, just some of the many questions that are going to be important as we move forward. Um, with that, my friends, I, I, I regret to, to kind of call to a close this, uh, this opportunity to be together, um, but I do appreciate everyone's willingness to come out and, and share this time with us and, and hopefully learn a little bit about what these documents contain, but also hopefully really stir that passion for you to go get the documents yourselves and to look at them. Each one of us shares a commitment and a passion for more of this type of research, and so our hope it, at the very least, recognizing that we have a small sample is that more is forthcoming. And so we certainly uh, look forward to, to, to hopefully that process playing out. Um, I wanna just uh, say that we also wanna thank Janan Musa for her uh, excellent reporting on this subject. I think it adds very richly to the discussion uh, and also uh, the CTC Sentinel team, particularly Paul Cruikshank uh, and Chrissy Hummel and Don Rassler for helping put all of this stuff out. We're going to do our best to make this recording available uh, after the fact, um, but more to follow on that. So please follow the CTC on Twitter at CTCWP, and we'll certainly post any updates and information there. But for that, uh, virtually at least, please join me in thanking our distinguished panelists. 
uh, for their their time, for their thoughts, and for really uh, giving us a rich discussion this morning. And thank you all for being out here. We hope that you have a great day. Take care.